Um, so again, this is Excel Like a Pro. I'm your host, Dr. Tom Franta, and we're going to be playing with some things. Excel is a little different than like Word or PowerPoint. A lot of times when we're working on a presentation, you know, I mean, you know, what we'll do is we just jump right into it, right? And with Excel, especially as we're doing this, you're almost a little bit more on, let's say, the programming side. So you really have to th think things through. And it's not uncommon to have to, in some cases, like rework something just because it's not coming out the way you wanted. Um, I don't know if we have chat GPT for spreadsheets yet, but if we don't, we'll probably get it soon enough. But we're going to cover a couple of basic topics. Um, first and foremost is spreadsheet design. That is king because if you don't have your spreadsheet designed properly things just fall apart then we're going to play with some formulas pivot tables uh graphics because again we just don't want to give numbers to somebody because when we give numbers to some to people they get confused everybody can see my screen okay okay great thank you and then if we have a little bit of time we're going to play with some add-ins that as um, we'll do solver table because that's one of my favorite ones when I used to teach quantitative methods in business. So we're going to do two basic uh, d demonstrations today. Um, one is going to be an academic one and it's with a grade book. And the second one is going to be more administrative and that's going to be when we're playing with uh, pivot tables. And then the fun is going to be solver if we have time for that. So again, as I was mentioning, when we're doing a spreadsheet, layout is and the design is is keen. We want to, hold on a second, Owen is trying to join and has having issues. Okay. So you, you really, uh, a sloppy spreadsheet is gonna have tons of errors. More often than not, when people call me in to help them solve a spreadsheet problem, the first thing I actually have to do is start asking questions. What was the purpose? What are we doing? And then cleaning stuff up. Uh, also, a lot of times, some people, my, my brother-in-law, one of my other buddies is notorious for it. They love huge spreadsheets. And in some cases, more worksheets is better. So you can break things up. It's more easy to digest. And in some cases, we do have to start over. One of the examples I like to give is one of my students we, was working on the spreadsheet and it was awesome. So he um, he was a, a pilot and he was also in management. He was working on a spreadsheet that would help to schedule the people who were able to give the flight instructions with the students that needed to be able to take the flight. Plus there's only a certain number of airplanes. So everything has to be balanced out. And he did up the spreadsheet. It was huge. It was awesome. It was impressive. It didn't work. So we sat down and we were going over it. And as he was explaining it to me and I was understanding, we started tweaking, we started shaping. And then we got to a point and I'm like, this is great. Now that we understand what we need to do and how we want it to look, we have to start all over. He was devastated. He was like, but Tom, you don't understand. I spent, you know, hours and hours on this. And I know we did. He, he, he'd spent a ton of time on it. And I said, I know, but we've got one of two choices. We can either start over and within sight of an hour, two hours, we'll have this whole thing pounded out the way we want it. Or we can try to take what you have now and make it fit what we want. And that'll probably take five to six hours and it won't look as good. So we agreed and we started over, but it's tough because you become attached to your spreadsheets and you're like, I spent so much time on this, but sometimes as you, you do that so you can understand it and then you start over so it's clean. Anytime I've ever done a spreadsheet where I just jump in and start creating it, I always end up having to throw it out and starting on over with everything laid out. As a matter of fact, when I usually start spreadsheet design, I use good old fashioned pen and paper just so I can get an idea in my head. So when we're playing with spreadsheets, you have the workbook, which can contain multiple worksheets. And on the bottom, you'll see it. So like an example, I will show you the, um, with the teaching one, with the, uh, with the academic one, I'm going to show you how I break that down things so that each worksheet of the workbook is one part of the assignment or what needed. So that way it makes it easier to understand. 
Another cool thing, this is kind of Excel 101, but just to, to mention it, one of the powers with Excel is what's called cell references, right? I can copy and paste. And if I copy and paste a formula down, what's going to happen is that Excel will adjust the cell, the, the formula in the cell, so it goes accordingly. This is great, but sometimes it's bad because I may not want. So let's say an example, I'm doing... Um, where we're doing some items and there's tax involved. Well, tax doesn't change. That's okay. My dog Coco will probably join me too. It's quite all right. So what happens is that I don't want the sales tax to change. So I want to make that an absolute value and I can lock that in and I can use dollar signs. And so an example would be if I use a dollar sign one, what that's going to do is that's going to lock in the one. So no matter what I copy, it's always going to be one. Uh, a, B, C, D, that'll change accordingly. I can also lock in, I can either lock in the row, the column, or both. But when we're doing spreadsheet design, there are certain things that we don't. Okay. Nathaniel says he can't see the screen. Can anybody else, can anybody, is anybody else having a problem seeing the screen? All right. Hold on. Let's try this. I'm going to do that and I'm going to. How is that? I can see it now. Perfect. You. Good. You know what happens? I Because I have multiple monitors and I moved it off to the side, I think that it, it jumped, but that's okay. So we have that. We're good. So let us do, do, do. All right. Boom. That's where I want to be. And okay. So what we're going to do is on our, um, what we're going to do is we're going to play with our, our spreadsheet and some of the formulas we're going to play with. And these are formulas that should be um, part of your repertoire are the if statement. It's very powerful. And then you also have variations of if, like sum if and count if. And this way um, you, sum if actually comes in handy when we do pivot tables. And I'll explain that when we get there. And then round and round up. And I'll explain these more in detail and we'll go through an example. And last but not least is VLOOKUP. So an example, when I'm calculating grades for a student, I will do um, round up. Round if the number is, let's say, 4.2. And I'll actually even have an example. So I'll show you in a bit. But the key is Roundup will always round the number up. Um, one of the reasons why I like doing that is simply because it um, it errors on the side of the student. It kind of pushes the grade up just a little bit, never lowering it down. Um, so the if statement, and I'll show you these in example, and, and when we when we start playing with the example, but it's really kind of cool. So what it does is it says if there's some logical test, if that logical test is true do something. If the logical test is false, do something else. So an example, just the, the bottom one, if roster A4 equals nothing, then give me nothing. Otherwise, give me what's in cell uh, worksheet roster cell A4. What that does is that that's actually a student's name. If a student doesn't have, if I, like, let's, when I do a spreadsheet for my, for my class, I will actually, I have a template that I use and the template has about 20, 25 student, uh, spaces for students. Well, I may not have 20, 25 students in my class. So because of that, instead of having these errors and weird things showing up, this keeps it clean. It also works out good too. Like in the, if the one above that is that um, in older versions of Excel, I think they've changed it. But if you do the average of a series of numbers and let's say there are zeros in those cells, it it gets mad and it doesn't get happy and it'd give you an error. So that that formula that uh, would actually fix that problem. And again, we'll play with uh, count if and sum if. And these are fun ones again, because count if is going to say, I'm going to let you know if there is something there. So if the cell has, like, I want to know how many students are in my class, I can say count if, and as long as there is a name there or something other than uh, nothing, it will count them up and it'll give me how many are there. Where some if 
is actually, again, what we will be playing with in the case when we're playing with pivot tables, where it's only going to add it if there's a certain condition. So in this case, it's sum if A4 to A17, if there's it sees Thomas. And then if it sees Thomas, it's going to go to the cell H4 through H17, and it's going to add those up. So it's really kind of cool. Um, round up and round down, uh, what round and round up are kind of cool because when we were playing with those, again, um, and I'll show you when we did the spreadsheet, it always errors on the side of the student. And then also just to give you another example, I saw it the other day, it was a bad math example where the person said to, to do rounding, but it was with gallons of paint. So how many gallons of paint do you need to do like, let's say 10 walls and each wall uses a third of a can of paint. And I said, okay, well, if you round a third to zero, and then I have a, then it means it's zero gallons of paint and it does 10 gallons of paint. Well, guess what? It would, it would say it, it would give you zero. So rounding in that case would be bad. Whereas if you round it up, it would round the point, the one third of 0.333. It would round that up to one. It would actually tell you that it's going to take 10 gallons of paint. Now, again, you don't need 10 gallons of paint, so rounding would probably be a bad idea, but it wouldn't be a bad idea is if I said, okay, it, take, it takes a third of a gallon of paint. I do a third of a gallon times it by 10, right? So that is, right? it would then give me the number of gallons I need, but then I would want to round that number up because, so what would be like three and a third gallons of paint? So but I can't buy a third of a gallon of paint. I have to buy, I'd have to buy four gallons of paint. So rounding up there would make sense versus rounding in and of itself, because then it would round it down to nine and I'd be short a wall. So that that's kind of it, if that, that makes sense. And then VLOOKUP is cool because what that does is when you have a your your grade for the class, right? Your grade is somewhere between a zero and a 100 where 97 and higher is an A, let's say, or 94 and higher is an A. At one of the schools I was teaching, they actually had an A plus four uh, was an option that you could get. And so what the VLOOKUP will do is it looks at your grade and then it goes to a table and says, ah, you got a 94. A 94 is an A. Or a 94 is four quality points. Oh, you got a 92. And it would go up and say, ah, a 92 equates to an A minus. So it, it actually does that comparison for you. And again, it's one of those things where we want to do things clean and neat because by doing that, it what it will do is it will give you, um, it, it'll, it'll um, there we go. It will help you so you make, um, less errors. So let me just give one second and okay, good. Let me make a note. There we go. So let's let's hop on in. I'm kind of throwing a lot of stuff at you. Let's let's take a look at let's play with the grade book. And minimize that. Well I can leave it that that's fine. All right. And let us share. Okay, you should be all be able to see the grade book. With this grade book, I have, again, it's just, it's simple, but remember when I tell you you want to break things down into sheets, into different worksheets. So at the end of every semester, not only did you have to submit the grades, but you also had to, uh, you could do it electronically, but they still wanted a hard copy. Well, this this worksheet right here is all they needed to know. They wanted to know the students' names, what they got for each, uh, whether it was their assignment, discussion board, quizzes, attendance, the final, and what their final grade equated to be. Clean, neat. They don't need to know what you got on every assignment. They don't need to know how many discussion board posts that you did. They just want to know the a summary. And then what happens is that you have a worksheet that gives... If all of a sudden now I need to see a student's um, assignments, I can boom. This is what you got for your assignments. This is what how many discussion board posts that they they did, um, and we have how many quizzes. 
So by doing this is it breaks everything down neat and clean. It makes it very easy for me to go over any of the information that is necessary. Let me just two seconds. I want to do my lights went dark. I want to see if I can just fix that a little bit. You know what? It's not. Ah, oh, here we go. Hold on a second. Sometimes things don't participate. Let me see if that makes things a little bit better. Okay, there we go. So I got lighting is changing on me. So as we're looking at this, again, if I want to see someone's attendance, it makes it very easy. It comes on up. For tables, these are my constant, things that don't change, right? I don't want to keep, I don't want to, if there is something that is a constant, it doesn't change, I want to have someplace where I can reference it and here are the tables. And remember before when I was saying about um, grades, well, this, this is exactly what I'm talking about. When we use the VLOOKUP table, this was gotten from, um, and sometimes I'd even put a note, it was this, like the student handbook and it would say, okay, a 97 or higher is an A plus or was an, was an A. If I wanted to be an A plus, I could just change it. And we'll, we'll play with that in a second. But the key is that these don't change. So you want them to be in one place, one place only, and you reference that. Um, back in the day, um, one of my bosses was calculating people's, um, how much of a pay raise we were going to get. And what happened is that he had what your salary was, what the pay raise was, and then he had a formula to determine what your pay raise would, your pay increase would be. The disadvantage is that, so he would say, okay, let's say you make $1,000 and you get a 3% pay increase. Then over here, instead of saying that it would be, you know, 10, uh, 10,000 times, you know, A times one point you know, a hundred times whatever in and of the pay increase, or I'm sorry, your pay increase times your salary plus your salary. Instead of doing that, he actually then in the column where your pay increase would be calculated, he actually wrote that number out. He did, he did the calculations rather than letting Excel or back then Lotus one, two, three, do the calculation. So long story short, he could change in the column which said what your percentage would be as an increase. But the number on the right would never increase because he hard coded the numbers. That is a bad spreadsheet um, design because it's just prone for errors. And that's why you don't want to do that. If you were going to give, let's say, everybody a 3% increase on the cell, you would put pay increase, make that 3%, and then you would use absolute cell referencing to always point to that. Um, let me give you another example of absolute cell referencing. So let's say that you can see here's the roster, right? And these are somebody's names. And then you can see that their names appear on every other sheet. Well, you see, remember before I kind of showed you this formula, it says if roster A4, that's this one right here, has something in it, then give me what's in it. Otherwise, don't give me anything. So what I would do is, so here you'll see that there is, it ends at last G, right? Well, all right, we're going we're gonna to add a student, okay? So we'll say um, last name is Smith, first name is John, just for lack of creativity. See how I put Smith, John Smith here? Now, when I go to every other sheet, John Smith appears, okay? So... Again, what we do is by doing clean spreadsheet design, I don't have to worry about misspelling John's name. What happens if all of a sudden, oh, it wasn't John Smith, it was Jane Smith. Oopsie, well, guess what? It's fixed in every single place. So th again, this is by using proper cell referencing, you never wanna have to re-enter the same data value twice. You always want to reference it. And 
this is where I find most people make mistakes when 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 doing spreadsheets because they've hard coded something somewhere. Um, so now, okay. So and then again, so here, all of these these grades are calculated on their spe specific worksheet. So in this case, it just says to, here we go. It says, if the sum of C11 to P11 equals zero, then give me a zero because it means that there is no, no value. It's, it's empty. There's no person there. Otherwise, give me the average of C11 to P11. And so by doing that, the moment there's a, a grade in here, it will now go and I'll start figuring out the calculation. Now, when the way that I work with the assignments on this one, because everybody hands in their assignments and if they didn't, then they would end up getting zeros. They would adjust the grades accordingly. But again, we I could create a spreadsheet that would, would actually fix that too. Okay, then on the bottom, what I do is it also helps me to figure out what is the average for each assignment and how many people have submitted an assignment, right? So if all of a sudden Jane submits the assignment, you'll see that things change. Now the average changes and now the count changes. So the, again, just simple little things that can can make things cleaner. Let me see if I can find you the roundup. Um, doo -doo -doo. I think I got it here. Yes. Okay. So when I'm calculating a student's grade, what it, what I do is each grade has a certain weight. So the um, the assignments have a certain weight. The, 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 the discussion board, everything has a certain weight. And what I'm doing is, you see, I keep mentioning tables. What that's doing is that's going to the tables. And this is where my attendance and it adds everything as a certain part. So let's pretend that, I don't know, we had one of those things and for some reason we didn't do quizzes. I don't know why we wouldn't do quizzes, but I can easily go in here and say, now quizzes are worth 0% of the grade. Now you see me, because I make a silly mistake, I have a total here. So I know whether or not I've gone over 100%. And now I can say, okay, um, so let's say now your final exam is 35. Oh, wow, I really need to do math. See, but again, it, it helps me so I don't make silly mistakes. Now, when I go back over, the grades have changed. Okay, because again, I reference what I want. And if all of a sudden I was like, oh, I didn't want that. I think let's put this back at fifth. Was it 15 and 15? There we go. No. Um, all right. So that's 25 then. But you see, I can make the changes here and they come out here. So again, it just makes it cleaner. If I, if each one of these cells had what percentage the assignment, the discussion board, the quizzes are, if I made a mistake on one, it could affect the student's grade. Now, with this, the fun thing I do is round up. And the reason why I round up is, again, this gives the benefit of the doubt to the student. You've all probably had this happen before, right? Your grade is just on the cusp of an A minus and an A, or a B minus and a B, or a B and a B plus. This gives a benefit of the doubt to the student. As a matter of fact, a lot of times in my spreadsheets, I have a bunch of different things baked in which kind of fall in error of the student. So I'd rather give points to somebody than um, not give them enough points. Now, of course, there's also one fun thing um, that I, the reason why I also do this is because if a student now comes to me and says, you gave me a B plus and I should have had an A minus. Well, we can sit down and we can calculate the grade, but when I calculate the grade by hand, it doesn't have all these roundups built in place. So, Unless one of the grades was wrong, their grade will actually be, oh, wait a minute. Oh, my grade was a little bit lower. Or no, it was solidly a B plus. It wasn't an A minus. So again, it's one of those things where I'd like to err on the side of the student, but also when challenged, all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, maybe I'll be happy with the grade that I got because it probably should have been a little bit lower. So that's kind of it. Um, let's play with the V lookup. This is a fun one. Um, I know they're all they're all fun for me because I, lo I love it, like spreadsheets and I like numbers. Uh, so what VLOOKUP does is it says, OK, I am going to look up 
H4, which is 100, and it's going to go to letter grade, which is a table on my table's uh, worksheet, and I want what's in the second column. So I know that sounds odd, but so I go to my, I go to this range of cells, to this table that I created. It says, okay, a hundred. So when you do a VLOOKUP, each lookup is just like a VLOOKUP. One is vertical, the other is horizontal. You need to do them in this order from lowest to highest. If you do it in the reverse order, everybody always gets an A. So what it does is it looks on here and it goes, okay, a hundred. A uh, hundred is greater than zero. I move to the next one. A hundred is greater than six. It works its way down and then says, ah, a hundred is greater than 97. Boom. Or more likely than not, it probably works in reverse. It says 97 is greater than a hundred. I'm going to give you what's on this row. And it, want, and it wants what's in the second column, which is an A. I remember before when I said that if all of a sudden, let's pretend now Gettysburg College wants to give out A pluses. Okay. And then the A plus was... Um, do, do, do. wherever it is on my keyboard. Okay, well, wherever my, um, I would then put in an A plus and then here we go, just for lack of it. So now all of a sudden, now when you look on the roster, it automatically updated itself. You know, if all of a sudden, for some reason, um, all of a sudden uh, 93 and higher wasn't an A, maybe it's a 92 or maybe it was a 90. By, I can just do the changes here And you can see my roster updates itself accordingly. So does this make sense? It, this is like a way that we can have a spreadsheet that has um, multiple, yeah, it, it has a lot of depth to it and it saves us from making silly mistakes, which happen all the time. It We always, we never do the same thing over again. We always will reference if we, we don't, we don't add us, we don't, if the number has to be entered twice, we put it one place and we make reference to it. By doing that, it makes things uh, more efficient, less prone to error, and just, just cleaner overall. Um, also, the nice thing too, is you make a good template. And I, I've used this template for all of my classes, whether it was quantitative methods in business or, you know, in, intro to technology or or you name it. So the, you create it once, you do it cleanly, you make it adjust. Because again, remember, if let's pretend I had a class and it was, we don't have discussion board. It's not an online class. It's a traditional class. All I have to do is go to my tables and make the discussion board 0% of the grade and then adjust my other things accordingly. Um, so... Right. And now all of a sudden, this, I don't have to even, I, I can leave the discussion board tab here. It'll just be blank. And my grades will be calculated accordingly. So again, it would, it's one of those things where it's very easy to do. You change it in one place and it affects everything else. So let me just. <laughs> There we go. Just putting things back to normal. But so this is one way to play with a spreadsheet. And this is just a good, for me, as a fun example to give where you can see the various things that you can do. Okay, I'm going to close that. And then, all right, let's hop back over here. And just to make things a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... All right, and I'm actually just going to do this way. So, but then, uh... okay. So for pivot tables, as a matter of fact, let's, let's do it this way. There we go. Okay, so everybody should be able to see that again. All right, so 
pivot tables are, are, are coming very handy. What they allow us to do is, to, wait, hold on, there we go. Okay. What pivot tables allow us to do is they allow us to share a lot of data in um, a more compact way. So when we're dealing with large data sets, this just brings it all into one place. And again, you're giving the, the person, because a lot of times when you create a spreadsheet, you're actually going to be creating it for somebody else to use. So you want to make it as easy to understand as possible and also very difficult for someone to break. So that is one of the things that we we want to be able to do. And um, another thing, if we have time, I'll show you how you can like, you can lock cells, which is really kind of cool. But locking cells, it means people can't change them. Okay, unless they unlock them, of course. Um, again, by simple, taking a large data set and simplifying it, you reduce confusion. You make it easier for people to digest the information that you want them to digest. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I've seen data sets. And because they were so large, the person who was explaining it didn't fully understand it or it didn't add value. Uh, we used to have one person, they they would bring in this spreadsheet and say, look, I know everything. And they had this spreadsheet that was like, it was like, I'm telling you, it was over three feet long. It was crazy. But the thing is that that on paper is, was useless. It was too much data. It was too much information that it could, it was, it was too much data that could not be processed into useful information. Okay. And data is just a bunch of facts. If you can't put them into a useful context, you can't turn it into information, then it's useless. And again, and if you can't distill that information into wisdom, then you're plumb out of luck. Uh, dashboards are cute. We're going to create a, sil a silly, simple little dashboard in a bit. And like some people will say, who uses pivot tables? I, and some of you may, you oh, I use them all the time. Um, my my brother-in-law's, one works for the Federal Reserve, the other's a Wall Street guy. They use pivot tables all the time. They are constantly churning through huge sets of data that they need to now distill down into something simpler. Um, my son actually uses pivot tables for his Dungeons and Dragons campaigns. And he takes all the data and he he consolidates it down, which is really kind of cool. And if you like Dungeons and Dragons, it's a good thing. Uh, and then also when he was working at BJ's back in the day, they also would use pivot tables to take the massive amounts of inventory and data they have and break it down into easier to digest chunks. Um, when we're gonna do it, what we're gonna do is I just wanna explain some of the pieces of it and then we're gonna jump in just like what we did before. So in Excel, you have the insert menu and in the insert menu, you're gonna see data tables, uh, pivot tables. So we can do a regular pivot table or we can do, um, it'll even recommend ones for us. The key though, is that when we're doing a pivot table, um, we need to make sure that our data is clean. I know I sound like a broken record and it almost is, um, it's an Excel 101 basic, but if your data is not clean and your data is not neat, you can't do anything advanced. It's, it's going to stop you every time. So a lot of times when I see pivot tables break, it's because I have blank columns, there's a blank row, or my favorite is because they imported the data from something else, which almost always happens when you usually your data comes from some other source and you import it into Excel. And what happens is Excel trying to help you out will merge cells and pivot tables just, they get confused and they throw up and it just, it becomes a hideous mess. And all of a sudden the numbers don't check. And that's another thing that I do want to point out, you know, People like Excel because it does all the math and it does all the calculations for you, right? You don't need to necessarily understand the calculus behind uh, these formulas that you're using. Well, you don't necessarily have to understand, in other words, start doing derivatives or all that other fun stuff. The key is though that you do have to understand the basics. So like an example is if I add two positive numbers, even if I don't know what the result should be, I do know that when I add two positive numbers together, the resulting number has to be larger than this than the two numbers that I started with, right? So if I add two plus two and I get one, or I add two plus two and I get two, something should go off in my head and say, I think there's a problem with the spreadsheet. So that is one of those things that you, you kind of have to understand how the numbers are gonna go. And if all of a sudden the numbers don't go in that direction, now start diving down to where do I make a mistake in one of my formulas? Um, it, it does happen. 
and and silly mistakes do happen. So uh, another thing too is when you're you have your data sets uh, and you're and you're playing with your formulas, test them. Put in all zeros, see what happens. Put in the largest number you can think of, see what happens. So that that way you can make sure that you know that it's going to work and it's going to work for certain uh, sets, especially ones that you already know the answer to. And then that'll help as far as the troubleshooting and making things cleaner as we go along. So when we insert a pivot table, if I say recommended pivot tables, Excel's actually going to say, looking at the data you have, maybe you want something like this. You pick the one you want and it will create it. We're not going to do that because it's too easy. What we're going to do, we're going to create a pivot table from scratch. What we do is we say, we click on an insert pivot table. We say, we make sure that our cell is in the, the data set. And then Excel will go, oh, I think this is the data range you mean. Um, your, the data set you should have, every column should have a header. So that way, like this is the salespeople, this is the revenue, this is the, the date of the sale, whatever. But you, it needs to be all labeled and marked out. Once we do that, we just simply say, okay. And then you're going to get these two pivot table fields, which are really kind of cool. The first one that you see on the left is going to be every single row, every single column header is going to appear here uh, in the order from A through Z or however many you have. On the right is going to be where we want it in our pivot table. So like an example, if I was going to do sales by region, because I want to do it by region, right? I want each, I want to know like my North, East, South, and West. I want that to show up on my left-hand side. And then I want to see the sum of the revenue, which is the sum if formula, just Excel already has it baked in and it's using it as part of the pivot table. And it's going to sum all of the revenues for my North region, my East region, my South region, my West region. Then what happens if I want more detail? Well, I don't just want to have um, it by region. Maybe I want to have it by quarter, right? So I want to see the sum of revenue for my first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter. Well, if I have that information as one of my uh, table, as part of the, one of my headers, then I can choose that for the column. Then let's say I want to do this, but I only want to do this for a specific year. That's where I can now filter and it will say, okay, I'm only doing it for the year 2023. Boom. It's now going to give me all of only the sales by region for each quarter for 2023. So it's really, really cool. Um, and, and then this is just a nice little uh, graphic that, um, that, that Joe created. Um, but again, just, just to give an example. So I have my different regions, uh, Midwest, Northeast, South, and West, and I now have it for the values. So that is going to be the sum of the revenue, which is going to be, and I'll show you how that's calculated for each of the quarters and then for the year. It really, again, I can, when we do this, we're just going to do a simple one and we're just going to have um, salespeople and we're going to have their, their net revenue. But again, you can have more than that. As a matter of fact, let's, let's jump into the pivot table example. We're going to create the pivot table once you see how easy it is to do that, then what we're going to do is we're going to move into the charts and we're going to make it a little bit prettier. So hold on, stop the share. There we go. And... Mm -hmm. Let's share this one. Okay, everybody should be able to see. Okay, so here is a... Bunch of data. Okay, so this is uh, my friend John Akinpora. He actually created this this spreadsheet. So that's the one I've been using. It's an old spreadsheet, but it works for demonstration purposes. You can see that this has a ton of data, but my data is clean. There are no blank columns or rows. Everything has something in it. And it also, there's, you know, again, it's it, everything that we have to see here are headers. Everything is clean. So now when I want to create a pivot table, all I simply do is make sure that my I'm in somewhere in my table. If I, I do this and then I say insert 
pivot table, you see this, now I would have to go and select my data range. But you know what, I'm lazy, so I'm not gonna do that. I just said, oh, I click somewhere in here. And now when I click pivot table, you see it automatically fills in the data range. If there were blanks, blank columns or blank rows, it's gonna stop as soon as it sees the first blank row or the first blank column. That's why, again, you can't have a blank row or a blank column. It always happens. Now I can start the new pivot table. I can put it in a new worksheet. I can I can do whatever I want with it. In this case, I'm going to say create a new worksheet. I could even put it in a different workbook, but that's just a pain. We don't want to do that for this point. So I say, excuse me, I say okay. Now I've got. If you see, it created sheet three. So my data is still here. I'm on a new sheet, and I'm like, okay, what do I want? To this to be. So I, I want to see the my my revenue for my sales reps. So I, I go to my salesperson and you see it automatically put it in the row. And all of a sudden now all of my salespeople have been populated. Now I want to know what the, the revenue is, the total of the revenue for each one of my sales reps. So I scroll on down, I find revenue and you see how it added to the values and it says sum of revenue. There's a lot of other things I can do here too. I don't, it doesn't have to be some, I can change this. So there are other formulas that I can do, but for this example, let's just keep it simple. So now all of a sudden I have my, each one of my sales reps and how much they made. So let me kind of show you how this, we got here. Let's take a look at Andrew. Okay. So for Andrew, he's got, we're going to clean these numbers up, trust me, because it's driving me crazy. But $12,368 in revenue. Well, if I were to go over here, let's see if we can find Andrew. Oh, where are you? Oh, here we go. And I can say, just a nice one, Andrew. There we go. See, here's Andrew. These are all of his sales. And then if I look at the revenue, you will see that the his the sum of all of his revenue or all of his sales is $12,368.90. $12,368.90. So that's where that came from. So the, the pivot table is doing all of this for you in a clean, neat, easy way. And this can be done as long as our data is clean, neat, and well-organized. If it's not, then we're just out of luck. Uh, hold on two seconds. And where are you, Andrew? Mm -hmm. There we go. And then let's just, I just like keeping things clean. So put it back to the way it was. Okay. so. Now that we have this, I would not give this to anybody because plain and simple, it doesn't look clean. So probably what we would do is we highlight our, the revenue and we should make that look like currency. So all I simply do is highlight the cells, right click on it. I can format the cells. Let's give it currency. When you're dealing with larger numbers, you don't really need to have it, you don't need to have heat in 32 cents or 90 cents. So we can go to zero decimal places. It makes it look cleaner. So at least now the numbers look a little bit better. The other thing that we probably want to do is we want to sort this because even right now it's organized by their first name, which really is probably not the best way to do it. So I can right click and it doesn't matter which one I right click on. And then I should be able to sort it from largest to smallest. See, and now I've got, it's easy for somebody to look and say, ah, Nancy is has the most sales and Jan has the least sales. And now this could help whoever we're giving this to so they can now say, ah, you know what? Um, maybe Jan needs some assistance so that their sales aren't, um, because their sales aren't what they need to be. Or maybe there's something else that's going on, you know? And that's one of the fun things. Like if all of a sudden we wanted to, like maybe we might want to add by region. I think we have region in here. Um, and then what we could do is now see, maybe that has something to do with it. Maybe the region that Jan is in is, is, is one of our smaller regions, or maybe she's sharing it with other people. So again, we can break this down 
if we wanted to. So like, uh, you see, and now all of a sudden I can give the data and with the data, right? I said that my I have regions on my columns and I can see that Nancy is responsible for both the is is responsible for only the north region, and maybe maybe Nancy has one of the largest clients, and that's what's going on. Um, as for Jan, uh, Jan covers the west region, but so does uh, Marija and Robert. So again, you again maybe this might help to tell a story, or maybe it won't. But again, it, it's up for you to decide. We're going to go back to this for now. But that's how we see it is to create a pivot table. As a matter of fact, you know, if let's, we got time. Let's, yeah, I'm good. Let's, yeah, let's delete that. Okay. So again, if I wanted to create a pivot table, I come here, I say insert pivot table. I, can, I select my data range or I have it selected for me, providing I'm clicked in the cell. And then it's like, okay, what do I want? My, my rows to be, I want it to be my salespeople. And what do I want to know about my salespeople? In this case, I want to know their the revenue, the amount of sales that they've made. Once we have that, we just clean it up. We format it so that it looks like currency or whatever it is that we want it to look like. And we can sort it so that it makes it easier for people to digest. Oops. Well, that might be useful too. But let's just uh, largest to smallest. And that's all there is to it. So that is a simple, easy pivot table. Now let's say, but wait a minute. What if, you know, we want to make a chart? Because again, numbers are good, but charts are better, right? They They take physical numbers and make it visual. And I've actually seen people do like things with charts that are borderline sinister because we're programmed. We look at a chart and if we see numbers going up, we just assume things are good. And if we see numbers going down, right? The cave person in us goes, oh, oh that's so bad. I can't have it, right? So I've seen people do charts that actually displayed negative information in a positive way. And the people who didn't really understand what they were looking at, weren't asking questions, were like, oh, I guess things are going pretty well. And there was one which was hysterical. What the person did is they wanted to show that sales of one product were really, really good. So they kept throwing out all of the other data about all of the other sales of all the other products. So now when you only looked at the sales for this one product, it looked great. The sales were great. But when you looked at the overall portfolio, the sales of this one product were so tiny and so small, it really did not have any effect on the real bottom line of the company at all. Uh, so again, depending on how we show the data, we can tell a story. And, and charts are great at helping to tell stories. Just use them for good, not evil. So, okay, so now that I've got um, my data, I've got my pivot table, let's create a pivot chart. So if you see pivot table analyze, I have this thing that says pivot chart. So I click on pivot chart. And for this one, let's just do a simple bar chart and say, okay. So all of a sudden now it just creates it and I can click and I can drag. One of the things that's uh, is interesting is you have to be careful what you click on because there's usually like a lot of different things that you can click on. So for now we, we have this, this is a chart. It, it, it tells a story, but I don't like the story it's telling. It's a little cluttered. So we'd want to make it cleaner. So what I could do is you see, I don't want people to be able to change these so I can hide my axis fields. And I'm going to say all the field buttons, make them go away. Um, same thing here. This doesn't give me any value, so I can remove that. Um, I don't want the numbers here. To me, that's not helpful. I can remove them. These little stupid bars. Again, all I'm doing is clicking on them and deleting them. So that makes things look a little bit cleaner. Now, as you'll notice, it's a little weird. My names go from highest to lowest and Excel does it from lowest to highest. Why it did not take it the way it was supposed to, I don't know, but it's okay. I can right click on here. And if I go to format access, you'll see that this pops up over here. There's a little thing that says categories in reverse order. Once I do that, you see how everything flipped? So put it back. So I can do that. 
And now all of a sudden, it's a little bit cleaner. It this represents this. You don't you don't want them to be out of sync with one another. You know, if and then if we want, maybe what we want to do is I can I can click on here and I want to give um data labels, right? So everybody knows the numbers now correspond. It's kind of silly, but what I need to do is I need to kind of shrink this a little bit. You'd think you need to expand it, but you shrink it. Now my numbers are where they need to be. They're not overlapping, which is just kind of sloppy looking. You know, and if you want, you can do something along the lines. If I can click on my, my bars, I can right click. And I believe it's, let's say this one. Yes, and you see the gap width. If I make this number smaller, that looks good. It makes the bars fatter. It's kind of almost like reverse intuition, if you will. But that looks good. I, I, I like the, I don't like when the bars are too thin. Um, and then, you know, last but not least, maybe give this a better title, right? So um, sales by rep, December, I think this was 2014, whenever it was. But now you can see clean, neat, this tells a much better story than that. Does, does that make sense? Does that, you kind of see how we did that? Um, then, like I said, it's it just pivot tables are a great way that you can, you can do uh, these types of things. I've got, you know, I'm, I want to save a couple of moments uh, for questions, but I do, let's see if we can play quickly with just add-ins because there's, there's a, another fun piece that we have. Uh, I think it's now. Yes. Okay. So what we have is, um, this is, I used to do this in my quantitative methods and business class. And there's this add-in called solver. So let us... So in this spreadsheet, right, what it does is um, I'm doing a cost benefit analysis. I want to know I have a factory and I can build both um, tables and chairs in the example. And in order to build a table, uh, my table, I make $20 profit for each table. I make $15 profit for each chair. That's what these numbers are right here. Then how much materials does it take to make each item? So if I want to make a table, it takes two large bricks and two small bricks. If I want to make a chair, it takes one large brick and two small bricks. Right now, I have made zero tables, zero chairs. I also have a fixed amount of material that's available to me. This is just the way the world is. So in this case, I only have six large bricks and I have eight small bricks. So what this is telling me is that Whatever possible combination I do of tables and chairs, I cannot use more than six bricks, six large bricks, or more than eight small bricks. I can't use more materials than I, I technically have. And that's the, the limit that we have. So just to give you an example, let's pretend I made one table. If I made one table, you'd say, okay, well, that's pretty straightforward, Tom. You're going to make $20 in profit, and you're going to use two large bricks and two small bricks. And you can see that's exactly what happened. I've used two large, two small, and I made $20. If I made one chair, I made $15 in profit, and I only used one large brick and two small bricks. So with Solver, and it's under the Data tab, I would click on the Total Profit. So what I want to do is I want to optimize my total profit. So how many tables and how many chairs do I have to make such that I do not use more than the materials I have? So I would go to Solver, and I, I always start by clicking on the cell that I want to solve in. As a matter of fact, um, I, I don't, can you see the Solver parameter window that opened? You know, let me just to put it on the safe side. I'm going to stop the share, and let's share screen two. This makes that work. Okay. There we go. So I want to solve for G11 by changing my changing cells, C11 and C12. I'm um, C11 and, and D11. 
subject to the constraint that I cannot use more than I have G7 and G8. When I do that, we're also using a simplex method and I just simply say solve. Mm -hmm. And solver says, okay, boom, I found a solution for you. And I can even give me a couple other things, but we're gonna just ignore these for now, but I can do other reports on it, which are kind of cool. And all of a sudden now it's gonna say, okay, what you're gonna do is you're gonna make two tables and two chairs for a total profit of $70. I will use all of the large bricks and all of the small bricks. And it, it does, for us to come up with that answer, we'd have to run through all the possible permutations or do some advanced map. And this does it for us. Now, this is of course a very simple model, but it is, as you can see, it, it works really well. And it takes something that again, is, is pretty complicated, but makes it straightforward and easy to use. And again, I taught a whole class on this thing. So it is, uh, I just wanted to show you in, in a nutshell what we had. Okay. So that is pretty much it. It's 157. We only have about three minutes left, but I will open the floor up to questions. Um, if there's anything you want to see again, um, you can feel free to come off mic and ask it, unless you're a really good typer. Oh, you're, you're quite welcome. You're quite welcome. Okay. Well, um, like I said, I will hang around and uh, just thank you all for attending. Uh, like I said, I if you have any questions, um, we we have recorded this, and again, I can share the information with you. Just just let me know. Thank you, everybody. I enjoyed this.